In this video, I want to provide an analogy between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. And through this analogy, I want to introduce the Schrodinger equation. This video is part of a playlist on quantum mechanics. You can find the link in the description below. First of all, let's have a look at how classical mechanics treats one-dimensional motion. So we're going to focus on a particle moving in a one-dimensional universe. And we're going to try and describe the dynamics of this system. So first of all, let's draw a picture, a little diagram to help us visualize what's going on. So let's draw the universe. So the universe is one dimensional. We can represent that by a axis. And we can call position on this axis x. So this is the x axis. x is the variable that describes the position. And in this one dimensional universe, there's going to be a particle. And this particle has a mass m. So the mass m is associated with this particle that lives in a one dimensional universe. Now, let's take the Newtonian approach and try and describe the dynamics of this system. So what's our goal? We want to know the trajectory of the particle. So we want to know x as a function of t, the position as a function of time. So at any time, we can find the position, given the initial condition. So let's go ahead and write down Newton's second law of motion. That is the equation that is our starting point. So f is equal to m a. And this f can be thought of as the net force acting on this particle. In classical mechanics, in, per in particular in Newtonian mechanics, we want to focus on forces. Forces are very useful quantities to describe motion. But in quantum mechanics, we're actually not going to be thinking about forces as much, because they're not actually that useful in describing quantum mechanical motion. So f equals m a. What can we do with the left-hand side of this equation? Well, let's consider a conservative system. A conservative system allows us to write a potential energy function. And so the force is actually going to be the negative partial derivative of this potential energy function with respect to position. So minus dv dx. And this guy is a partial derivative. We're only differentiating with respect to position. So this is the slope. And this minus sign tells us that the force is in the opposite direction of the slope of the potential. So this is a property of conservative systems. So conservative systems allow us to write the force in terms of the potential in this manner. And this is actually related to the work energy theorem. So not all systems are conservative, but a lot of the systems we'll be dealing with are conservative. You can have a potential energy function, and you can uh, easily write it in terms of this kind of expression. So V is actually used as the potential energy function. This is not the voltage. It's not the electric potential. So there's some confusion there, because it's often called the potential, but this is just shorthand. This is kind of like a, a slang term, right? Because we don't want to be saying potential energy function every time we're referring to capital V. This is the same in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, capital V is also the potential energy function, which I will just call the potential. So that's the left-hand side of the equation. That's going to give us the net force acting on the particle. What about the right-hand side of the equation? I'll keep m, the mass, because that's not causing us any problems. But let's repackage acceleration. Acceleration is the time derivative of velocity. And velocity is the time derivative of position. So we need to go two derivatives with respect to time to get from, uh, to get from position to velocity, uh, and then to acceleration. So what does that mean? We can rewrite acceleration as the second time derivative of position. So let's go ahead and do that. So the second time derivative of position. That's this guy. This over here is the acceleration. So anytime you see the second time derivative of uh, position, just know that is acceleration. I'll write this a little more clearly. What you can actually do is you can rewrite this equation as m dv dt, right? The first time derivative of velocity. And because velocity is just the time derivative of position, then we can just uh, open that up and repackage it as the second time derivative. So that is what this is saying over here. 
we now have a differential equation, right? And to solve a differential equation, we need some initial condition. So we're going to need to know what is the position, let's go x, at time t. So this is uh, at time t equals 0. And we're going to need to know what that value is. And that's going to be something like x sub 0. And we're also going to need to know the velocity or the momentum. But typically in Newtonian mechanics, we're going to go position and velocity. So this guy, we also need that at t equals 0. And that's going to be v sub 0. So these are just the initial conditions that are going to allow us to solve this system. So how difficult this system is to solve is going to entirely depend on this potential. This potential could be a nice simple potential like a Hookean potential, like a spring. It could be a Coulomb potential, a gravitational potential. It could be any of these common potentials. And the difficulty of uh, the, finding the solution to this is just going to depend on this V function, the potential energy function. So all of this stuff over here is going to end up giving us the thing that we're looking for, which is the position as a function of time. And this over here, this can be thought of as the trajectory of the particle in its one-dimensional universe. You can actually generalize this to three dimensions. All you have to do is describe these quantities as vectors, and then you'll have three sets of equations for everything. Right? There's going to be three sets of equations for the force, three sets of equations for the acceleration, all that kind of stuff. So you have f equals ma in the x direction, in the y direction, in the z direction. And that's going to allow you to generalize this to our three-dimensional universe. So that's how Newtonian mechanics treats motion. Uh, and it's actually very, very different to how quantum mechanics does. So let's have a look at how quantum mechanics would treat this same problem, this same problem of one-dimensional motion. So in quantum mechanics, we actually have to forget uh, about these uh, intuitive ideas like force and velocity and position. And we have to rethink of, of new definitions that are going to help us out. What we're actually looking for is a thing called the wave function. And that's represented by the Greek letter psi. So it looks like a triton, like a triton. So it's like Poseidon's triton. And psi is going to depend on x and t. This is actually going to give us all the information we need and all the information we can possibly know about the particle. It's actually going to allow us to find probabilities of measuring possible outcomes. So in Newtonian mechanics, everything uh, is known to uh, as, as much precision as we want. Right? So the, the only place where uncertainties arise is in our measurements. But in classical mechanics, everything has an intrinsic uncertainty because uh, it is a probabilistic description of the universe. So let's have a look at how we can find this wave function over here. So what we actually need to solve is a thing called the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation uh, in, in this kind of scenario where we just have one dimension is actually going to look like this. We're going to have a time derivative of this wave function. And that's going to be equal to a bunch of other terms over here, which we'll talk about in a second. So there's going to be some partial derivatives showing up on this side as well. But they're going to be with respect to position. And we're also going to have the potential energy function showing up too. So psi is our wave function. That is this thing that we're trying to find. It's the analog of the trajectory. Right? We can't actually get a trajectory for the particle because we don't know what the particle is doing until we measure it. But we can take all the information that we know about the particle and put it into this. This wave function contains everything that we can possibly measure. So this guy, we're going to find him by solving all of this. And this is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And this is a lot like f equals ma in quantum mechanics. This side over here has some kind of time dependence. So this, this, is going to, this left hand side is telling us how the wave function is changing with respect to time. And this right hand side has two terms. There's this term that depends on a partial derivative. There's a partial derivative with respect to position. And then we're just multiplying by the potential function over here. So this looks very, very different to uh, this type of equation over here. So we only have a single derivative with respect to time. So we're, we're just looking at the single, the first derivative. We're not looking at the second derivative, as was the case here, where we had acceleration. This equation uh, is also very, very different because it has an imaginary unit, i, 
multiplying time derivative. In classical mechanics, we can sometimes use complex numbers and the imaginary unit i to make problems uh, easier to solve. But in quantum mechanics, the equation of motion actually has i in it. So we have an imaginary term in the equation of motion. And that's actually a, a very confusing thing to think about. So what we're actually going to need to solve this is we're going to need more information about this potential. And we're also going to need to know what psi is doing at time equals 0. So we're going to need to know this uh, wave function at t equals 0. And if we solve this with the initial condition, that is actually going to give us the wave function psi of x and t. And then we can use this to find things that we want to measure, like the probability of measuring a certain position value or a certain momentum value or a certain energy value. So this guy is actually going to give us all the possible things that we can measure. So you can see that the two approaches are very different. In classical mechanics, everything is infinitely precise and deterministic. In this understanding of non-relativistic, quantum mechanics in one dimension, everything is still deterministic. The wave function is still uh, completely deterministic until you measure it. At the point of measurement, it actually uh, gets very complicated. And it's no longer a simple function just changing with respect to time. And the next few videos in this series are going to be about this equation. And this equation is the Schrodinger equation. It's a very important equation in quantum mechanics. And we're going to be doing a lot to try and solve this equation and to try and understand what it's actually telling us. So uh, a little recap of this video. On the left-hand side over here, I've provided a Newtonian understanding for one-dimensional motion of a particle. And over here, what I've done is I've provided the quantum mechanical analog. So this is just an, anal an analogy so that you can actually see where this is coming from. The Schrodinger equation is just the quantum mechanical version of f equals ma. It's the equation of motion. It's telling us what the particle is doing. But we can't assign easy things like force, position, and momentum to the particle because those things are not actually known to us until we perform a measurement. You can watch the other videos in this playlist on quantum mechanics if you click over here.